you know you love passwords. You love changing your passwords. You love making passwords that no one can ever figure out, no matter what you do. This week on SDL, Russ and I will talk about passwords. You guessed it. Hang around. This is a Security Weekly production. Welcome to Secure Digital Life. And you type in AAA porn or whatever it is you're typing in. I'm, so, I'm sorry, we, I was at a PG show. And I'm really okay. excited to be here. I'm glad you're here because somebody needs to know what's going on. That's right. Okay, so now, now somebody has to drink this. <laughs> I think it's another day, it's another episode. Yeah, he's looking at the wrong camera. You, oh, oh, you moved my, you put my camera over here. Eh, cut. Basically, forget you ever saw that. I, I think actually forgetting you ever saw that would really be a good idea at this point. Ah, it's us. We're here. How about that? It happened. Russ, he's here too. We're all here. Uh, this week, uh, be sure and keep your mind on AnyCon. AnyCon is on June 16th through the, and the 17th in Albany, New York. So it's going to be there at the, uh, out of the Civic Center or something like that, yeah, wherever they have like in that, Albany, yeah. New York, and at the Renaissance Hotel, which is supposed to be really nice. Mm -hmm. We're going to be there. We are. Uh, Security Weekly is going to be there. Roger Williams is going to be there. I'm bringing along some of my students who are going to get forced to do horrible manual labor stuff like wash my car and detail it while we're doing other things. Uh, you, if you're listening, you didn't hear that. No, not, not <laughs> you students that were listening. You're good. It, it, uh, it was some <laughs> other students that we haven't mentioned yet that are getting to go along. Um, Russ is going to come too, so we're, we're all going to get to go. Yay. We were yeah. talking about sharing a hotel room versus not, and then what do we have options for? Feathered pillows or? Yeah, it was a bunch of really yeah. bizarre, twisted weird, stuff that weird was scaring stuff. us yeah. because we're used to staying in hotels where they ask if you'd like, you know, like beds or sheets or, you know, do you need a gun with that? And just like there's a shotgun behind a thing. It's just break glass if yeah, necessary. Break glass if necessary. Or just yeah. anyway, or the glass is already broken and the shotgun's gone. <laughs> 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 and there's a hole blown in the front door. <laughs> Okay, we should be serious though, because this is serious. This is a serious. This is serious a serious show. passwords. It's a ser yeah, it's a serious thing about passwords. So, do you use password dress? Uh no, never, <laughs> never, never had a password in my life. Uh, yeah, I mean, I use. I must have as an IT person probably. I don't know, 100, 150 stored in my head somewhere or yeah. iterations of passwords and all that kind of thing. Well, I think I think we all come up with passwords uh, in our lives, and, and, and we have a lot of different approaches mm -hmm. to it. And in the, in the last five or six years, a lot of industry people have started trying to force us into to different models of passwords. And one of the things I wanted to bring up uh, to you was that uh, NIST just released a draft of a new document. And if you don't know what NIST is, you should. Uh, NIST is the National Institute for Standards and Technology. Yay. And uh, there's actually a guy there named Doug White that works there. It's kind of interesting when I go down there. But um, they released a draft document that basically says now that some of the stuff that we have been told for so long Long, that is great is maybe not so great after all like one of the things that we get told over and over is that you have to change your password all the time and that it has to be a combination of all these things so there's some interesting things there I mean, I'll put a link to the NIST document if it's really grim to read it's like this big fat thick mm -hmm. thing and use a lot of really big words and it, it was I was bored after I read the title page but uh, you know it's a government document but they are making changes to that so one of the things that that has been around for a long time is uh, is what is called a strong password. Mm -hmm. So, I, what, what do you think about that? I mean, do you have I, a? I mean, typically, you know, they tell you. I, I look at banks because banks are, you know, they have my financial data, so I get really, you know, I, I want that to be a, a secure as password as as I can remember. Uh, and then, so they they recommend eight letters. Right now, they recommend eight or more characters um, with uh, one at least one capital letter, one number, or special symbol. Um, and nothing containing any of your numeric values, like right. your social security number or address. Right. And one of the things, I mean, basically the strong password is defined by different people at different times. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, like you say, typically it's like at least eight characters long. It has letters, it has numbers, and it has symbols. And you're supposed to mix those things together. But that's not what NIST started getting at. Right. What NIST started getting at was the idea that, that one, everything can be broken. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very, very important that you understand that. A, a computer can eventually generate enough cycles that everything is going to be broken. So... 
the real secret is to how well known and easy are these passwords to break rather than what kind of patterns do they fall, uh, follow. And my concern, and I've had this concern for a long time, is that when you force people to change their passwords all the time, they tend to go into bad behavior. Because you have a password right now in your head. Think of it. It's Everest, right? No, it, it, it's not from a movie. Oh, uh, how about uh, C Fidelio? Too many secrets. <laughs> Fidelio. Uh, Croatoan. That's for you, Katie, if you're watching. Um, but... Uh, <clears throat> It, it says Croatoan on, on, on up, up <laughs> but um, if those words are known, then they're much easier to predict. And this is called a dictionary attack. And so one of the most common ways to get your password, besides phishing you, which we talked about before, is to use a dictionary attack mm -hmm. on that. And so when I do forensics, I have a giant text file that started with the Oxford Unabridged Dictionary. OED, yeah. So I literally took that giant unabridged dictionary, and, I, and you can get it online. You can download it. So that means if you used any word in the Oxford mm -hmm. Unabridged Dictionary, and next week we're going we're gonna to actually break some passwords on the show, so we're going to show you how to do it. But you could break those passwords almost instantaneously. So... That means that that is a far greater weakness than if you had a, a really long, lengthy password. So changing from one dictionary word to another every 30 days so that you can remember it is kind of defeats the purpose, and mm. it doesn't really improve things. And what also was found to happen was people started with good passwords. Yep. So my original password is Croatoan10579. That's not really my password, so don't waste your time. But that's my original password. Okay, I know that password because that was my grandmother's middle name, mm -hmm. and, and it was, the, I don't know, it was the number of the license plate of my first car, some wacky thing that I have in my head. Okay, fine, that's cool. So that worked for 30 days. Now the IT department comes on, and they go, oh, sorry, got to change that password. It's been 30 days. And they go, okay, I'll change to a Croatoan 1080. Okay, well, that didn't help much, for one thing, and, but it did change it. Mm -hmm. So if it was known somewhere, then fine. I, I get popped. Yep. And, and I've changed it. But the trouble is, now the next 30 days, oh, now I've got to change again. Is it 1081, 1082? Right. And, and eventually, over time, what, what NIST was talking about was that these passwords get known, and they get added mm -hmm. to lists you can download. Mm -hmm. So if you go online. I, I, put it, I put the link to it okay. in the Facebook. If you go online and you search for lists of passwords, yeah. You can download huge text files that don't just include dictionary words from Oxford Unabridged Dictionary. Now they include leet speak words. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what do you, do you, do you know what leet yeah, speak yeah leet speak. So you know you would use like uh, a reverse seven for an L or H A X right. O zero yeah. R S instead H of H A C X zero yeah. R. Yeah. So Lee, and there was a guy on Jeopardy that did, what was it was that Ken Jennings that did L E E he did his oh final yeah he did one, three, three. Three. yeah exactly yeah one that's what he bet. And, and, and guess what? Everybody breaking passwords knows about lead speak, so it doesn't do anything no. for you. Used to, it was kind of this like, okay, I'll use that instead. So mm -hmm. now instead of Croatoan, I put CR0 ampersand, you know, and on and on and on. And that theoretically worked. Doesn't work anymore. <laughs> they know about it, and it's on the giant list of words. But keep going. Don't stop there. It gets worse. The bad news is, is that now they keep adding to these. Every time somebody cracks a password, they put on these lists. So that means even if you've got really sophisticated passwords, they may actually be on the dictionary list. And I guess ultimately in some weird quantum thing, we were talking about quantum physics before the show, it tells you what kind of lives we have, um, you know, you'll have a, a, almost a huge list of all these possible combinations of every eight-letter combination. And that's what a dictionary attack really mm -hmm. does. And it doesn't matter then if you mix in symbols. and It's just increasing the likelihood or, or decreasing the likelihood mm -hmm. so it keeps taking longer and longer and longer. And as computers get increasingly more powerful, like when we move into quantum computing, they can crack uh, <laughs> hundreds of millions of passwords or they can attempt those in dis dictionary attack format. E even like today, that. one of the tools I'll show you next week is a forensics tool and we'll crack some passwords with it. Any dictionary word, even a lead speak word, it will probably crack it in before you, it just almost instantaneous. It cracks so fast because you have a real souped up computer mm -hmm. to do it with. These are called brute force attacks as well. So a brute force attack is instead of me using a dictionary list, which is my preference, it just sits there and churns. So it starts with A, and then it does AA, and AAA, and AAA. And a computer can do this so fast, you'll see these things on a brute force. Mm -hmm. It may process 2 million passwords, you know, in, it just instant. You'll see it go 2 million, 5 million, 7 million, 
25 million, and, and it's just doing all these possible approaches. Now, as your password gets longer and longer and longer, that means that it takes longer and longer and longer to get brute forced. So the ideal password then is something that's almost just totally random, full of symbols, numbers, underscores, all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, you, you, you have any comments on that? I think that, um, I, I mean, yes, that's where we're at now, right now in password uh, complexity models, but I think that over the next three to five years, those are going to um, be substituted by things that are a lot more in terms of characters. But, but you, you, you really begin to suffer the, you know, for security's sake, you begin to suffer the ability to remember those passwords. So right. what happens? People write them down, which is what, number one, don't do that, right? Yeah, I mean, we did, so, we did a pen test once, and, and we got the password by looking through the window. Yeah. You know, I didn't come up with this password because I was super crazy clever. I mean, the guy thought that, and I'll, of course, let them believe it. But we really just looked in the window, and on the server rack, they had passwords on Post-it notes to, for the yep. servers because they were these big, long, you know, 15 characters of random things. But we got them through that mechanism. So, yeah, if you can't remember it, it becomes a problem. And it becomes a problem for another reason, too. This, let me, uh, another reason it's a problem today is that our passwords have started to expand beyond... Like when I got started, you might have one password. You know, it was the mainframe, and then there was a there was a super user password on the mainframe, and I knew those two, and they were really I had to memorize the super user one. It was a big long string, until I realized it was the monitor serial number. Oh, if you looked on the back of the monitor, it was a big oh, long geez. string. Oh, that's a good way to create a password. I mean, nobody could get to it unless they get in the server room, and if they're in a the server room, they own you anyway. Mm, but that's true. Today, as your password surface expands, so now you've got passwords on here. Not just one. You've got, you've got an Apple one or you've got an Android one. You've got passwords on apps. You've got all those things. You've got passwords to get into work. You've got passwords to get into your house. you got, I mean, like, I, just to get in my house, we have passwords. Yep. And, and you have to know what they are. And so some people know those. But as that expands and you start saying, I need to know 21 characters in my head. i got to know that all the time. And I have to be able to recount those passwords on the fly while I'm driving. Uh, you don't do that. That's bad. It's illegal. Yes. But, but people do it. And I, you, know, you see people trying to do that. And, and I run into this all the time because I have stacks of passwords. And I have public and private. I have all these rules that I tried to set up. And it gets really, really hard to do. Now, so um, the ISC squared people, uh, I don't know if they came up with this or not. So if, you, if they didn't, I'm, it, may, it may have been a SACA that came up with this. I'm not sure. Um, the idea that the best passwords, the best way to protect things was, was by th this thing they call the three-piece the three piece triad or something like that. This is a technical sounding thing. It was something you know, so that's a yeah. password. Something you have, so that was like a dongle or something, you know, really cool. Now a cell phone. And, yeah. and a cell phone. And something you are, mm -hmm. so that's like a drop of blood. You know, so you, like on Gattaca, where you stick mm -hmm. your finger oh, yeah. on everything and it checks your blood every time and your genetic footprint is what gets you through the door. Those are, are much more sophisticated, but they're also much more intrusive and it's much harder for you to deal with that out in the public space. Uh, coming soon is probably two-factor authentication on a lot of things mm -hmm. because as we see uh, endless hacks of these passwords and people aren't very good at maintaining them, but here's one big giant caveat that's laying on the table like a stinking carcass. If you give up your password, mm -hmm. you hand it to someone. Uh, I got an email just this morning that said, please go log in. Uh, it said, your bank account has been compromised. Mm -hmm. Please log in here to correct this matter immediately before your funds are drained. If I had clicked that and I gave up my password, I just gave up almost everything I've got. And Nothing's going to protect you from that. But two-factor authentication, which you've probably heard people talk about now, so you see that a lot, um, is, is where you have a password and you have something else. So the most mm -hmm. common one is a text to your mobile device. So you see that a lot. So if you go on, on eBay, if you go on PayPal, if you go on Apple, all these things, uh, you have to actually use two-factor authentication. Mm -hmm. So you enter a password, which now maybe doesn't need to be so strong, and you also have to reply with some kind of code that's yeah. sent to your phone. These things are a giant pain, but you do need to be using yeah. them. When I was in Australia, I landed in the airport. I needed to get online to check a few emails. And um, I needed to get to my keychain because I had forgotten my password. Right. For, I couldn't open the keychain because <laughs> Apple had found me on a, on a network that I'm not uh, usually on. Because I'm, you know, I'm usually right. in the United States. But they saw, so they blocked 
and locked my access. And then they had to, they sent me a text message, which I couldn't use because I had a new SIM card in my phone, <laughs> so I had a new phone number. So long story short, I ended up getting on, but only after an hour, hour and a half worth of different things. It's, so, it's very it's troublesome. I had problems with Apple recently, too, because mm -hmm. they I actually had pre-two-factor authentication on my Apple device, and I couldn't get in. And for some reason, somebody tried to hack my password, and it shut me out. And then I was trying to get in, and I didn't know some kind of weird crypto code that they gave me back when I created an account in like 2005. Wow. They were like, you need this piece of paper. And they kept asking, acting like I ought to just, you know, oh, yes, let me get that here out of the file. But um, so that, that's coming. What NIST was advocating, and there's a lot more to this NIST document than just this basic stuff, but NIST was advocating that basically uh, enterprises should try to uh, analyze their passwords rather than making people change them. So looking for weak passwords. Oh, yeah. Interesting. So by finding passwords that are on these lists, and we've been advocating that with planning for years and years and years. I've been telling people, you can crack your own passwords. And this is from the earliest pen testing stuff I ever did, was getting in there and saying, let's see if we can crack these. And instead of just making a guy who is a, you know, my password is 777. I had to change it. Now it's 778. Oh, they won't let me change it to something that similar. So I changed it to 877, and that went through. It's just ridiculous. So I pretty much agree with this, that if we were watching this and we had real-time monitoring software, so when you have a bad password, we immediately notify you and say, you must change this password or lock you out until you do, you're going to force people into better models of that. Now, I have a, uh, a four-tiered approach uh, to this, which sounds overly complicated, but it's not. And so when, when I do passwords, or I recommend to enterprise, you have to kind of analyze your situation and decide a couple of things. One is who has access to this. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to give this to, to a bunch of people, that's a very different thing than if this is my personal password to protect my secret vault, where I keep all the good stuff. And I call those Uber passwords. And I make these very strong passwords if I can, but they are based uh, on, on something. So I'm not going to give you any kind of, they're not dictionary words or anything <laughs> like that. But I have a mechanism in my head that I can sort of generate these things and I can recreate them on the fly, uh, but they're not going to be something that's easy to hack. If I give it up, it's still given up. Mm -hmm. But this is something you'd use for your bank account. Mm -hmm. something you, anything that involves money being taken from me or my personal stuff being stolen. Even personal stuff doesn't matter to me as much as money. Because if somebody can drain my bank account, I don't ever, and I'm going to never use that password except once. So that password's on one thing and one thing only, and it's never used anywhere else ever, and you salt the earth and you never let anything grow there again. Um, I also have, my tier two passwords are strong. I call them strong passwords. And these are good passwords. And, and all my passwords are good, so I don't use any bad passwords. But my, my strong passwords are stuff that I would share with people I know. Mm -hmm. So like if I need to give my wife uh, the key code to my house, if I need to give my daughter access to my Apple account or whatever, those are passwords I still feel are pretty trusted, mm -hmm. but they can certainly be disclosed because mm -hmm. maybe my daughter didn't uh, protect it the it way she should have. Yeah. And, and are those kind of problems. My tier three passwords then are things I would use on public sites that I, I use a lot. So if I have an account on New York Times, I don't mind using the same account on, on New York Times as Washington Post or something like that, but I'm not going to use these passwords on anything that really matters. But there's still things that are just private to me. Mm -hmm. But I consider them compromised from the moment I use them. So I assume that if that, if that password is going to, because you can't control it. There's a company sitting out there, and you have no idea if they're going to protect that password or not, and you see breaches every day mm -hmm. where a company like, you know, Company X jumps in and says, we're so sorry. We've lost all your personal data and your passwords and everything about you to someone that we don't know who it is. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Change all your passwords. But I, I use these, and so I have, again, I have a system for that. And then finally, I have what are called throwaway passwords. And throwaway passwords are stuff, if I get a site that tells me I have to register for something, like I just want to read a news article and it says, create an account and register, I use a fake email account and I use a fake password. And I, I presume I'll never, if I do go there again, I'll create a new account. And so I just, I have several domains, like I bought hothorse.us last night. Um, the name of a restaurant. <laughs> Check it out. Uh, oh boy. Hot Horse. Hey, Nick, you know who you are. Uh, Hothorse.us. And, and so I'll create accounts and I just call them, you know, Mr. X at Hothorse.us. 
make an account, and I just put some dummy password. And honestly, I don't even care if the password's weak on that one. I'm just going to go in there, and, and I'll just throw some random password in there. I usually just use a random password because I get in one time, and I read the article, mm -hmm. I'm gone. And, you're gone yeah. and next time, I'll create a whole new account. What, what about you? You have any, any Yeah, I mean, I, I use a similar tiered approach to you. Um, you know, I, I, I have a three-tiered approach, and I have uh, a formula that I use typically f um, for... Uh, creating those those longer passwords, like okay. the, you know, not exactly the same ones or iterations, but a formula. Yeah. So you know, I, and I find that to be easy, the easiest to remember. For okay. Me. Uh, the other the other thing that you can certainly do are the use of, and I will show you some of these next week too, are the use of password vaults. Mm -hmm. uh, there are tools. These have their own set of problems. Uh, password vaults typically will generate passwords for you. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them, like Passware, is one that mm -hmm. uh, or LastPass. Sorry, that's the one I'm thinking of. LastPass will let you install it on your phone and your computers and everything else. It shares your vault with you. Well, uh, Keychain does that as well for Mac. Keychain does that. Um, I believe Firefox has a built-in component now as uh, well. Google, yeah. if you're using Google. For Chrome, yeah. All those have the problem that if they get compromised, then you're oh, going to yeah. lose everything. Now, theoretically, they're stored encrypted, and the encryption can never be broken, we'll but we've see. heard that before. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, six months later, they're going, we're so sorry. A, a horrible exploit in our software allowed a bad person. But I, I do like vaults, and, and, and I use vaults because it's, it's a good way to remember all these collections mm -hmm. of passwords that you might have. And a lot of times these vaults allow you to create passwords. Mm -hmm. So you can create, create really long encrypted passwords on any of these vaults, and I do like that. Um, one other, I'm going to talk about one more thing, which is a passphrase. Mm -hmm. Have you, ever, have you ever heard of that? Yeah, and so a passphrase would be something like, let's say, uh, you know, it was a dark and stormy night. Like, people are right. not using passwords, single words anymore. They're using phrases or sentences from their favorite works of art or, you know, whether it be music or literature or whatever. And, and that kind of turns into what I, I, I call it, it's not true, but I call it a quantum password. Mm -hmm. Because now instead of just this single dimension, you've expanded into multiple dimensions. And one way you can make passphrases is called a one-time pad. And a one-time pad was an old spy thing that people did a long time ago. And they, if you share a book with someone, mm -hmm. so you say, I've got version 3, volume 5 of Moby Dick. And we're going to, every day, we, we start at page 35, and every day we turn the page. And you can use phrases from the book. And they, this created essentially on-the-fly one-time pads between two people. Uh, you can create passphrases out of books that you have on your desk. Mm -hmm. uh, just don't use the first line or something like that. Mm -hmm. The problem with passphrases is they also give you a false sense of security. Mm -hmm. Because if you do use a passphrase like, call me Ishmael, mm -hmm. uh, that's the first line of Moby Dick. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? That's in the dictionary attack list. So it's just, that's just a really long set of characters. So you really need to be careful about that. To me, the ideal of just this limited world. So all you out there, they're going to say, Doug, you're, you're being too narrow. I, I advocate the three-tiered, three-leg tripod of hell tripod, or whatever yeah. that's called. But, but really, uh, if you're just using passwords, what I call the jumbled uh, passphrase approach is probably a, at least a shot at it. And it means take two passphrases and mix them together in some random way that you can, you can recall that in your head. So you don't have to remember the whole passphrase, but if you can go back to two different books and say on page 60 of one and page 99 of the other one, the first two lines, and I interspersed every other word, you can make these little wacky formulas. Of course, then you'll forget them and be calling somebody going, oh, I made this password. It's like 98 characters long. That's one problem. The other problem, and it's the worst problem, a lot of systems don't support it. So right. you'll get it has these to be like systems. Eight to thirty-two characters. Well, a lot of them won't even let you have more than eight. Yeah. I've been on plenty of sites where it's like a, yep. you're limited oh, right. to eight characters. Yep. I'm like, really? You're right. And then they say an eight character strong. Password. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, wow, guys, you might want to expand that a little bit. It's a little shocking when you run into that uh, kind of stuff. Uh, lastly, on this, remember that if your passwords are compromised, I don't care if they're seven 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 or they're six hundred and. 90 characters long of random strings, if they're compromised physically, they're compromised. Yep. And that means you need to use VPNs when you're mm -hmm. in public Wi-Fi. That means that you need to be sure that websites you're putting passwords in, you're putting in passwords you don't care to lose. Because if you aren't, someone's going to get it. And worst of all, at the end of the day, if you get fished, you're done. Yep. And, and that's, that's the end of that story. So moral of the story is, if you do get compromised, then you should change all of your passwords. Like, all, all of them. Absolutely. Every single one of them. And I know it's a daunting task. I mean, like I said at the beginning of the show, I have about 110, roughly. 
110. Well, well, the, the basic rule of hacking is to escalate. I mean, yeah. as, if there was one single word involving hacking, it's the word escalate or, or exploit. It's probably the better mm -hmm. word. But escalation means taking one thing and getting to something else. Mm -hmm. So that means if, if I get your really lame password that gets me onto one site, I may be able to extract information from that site about you and get other passwords that you used in different things. Mm -hmm. If you've got passwords stored in text files on your computer, mm -hmm. now I get in your computer, I get your password, it's got your bank account in it. Mm -hmm. Well, if the password of your computer is 777 and that's where the attack came from, it doesn't matter that you've got that super awesome, cool password you had designed by a password consultant for you. Although I'm thinking about starting that business. So if anybody wants to finance <laughs> password it, consultant. I, I'm a password valet. Uh, so you actually go out, and I will come to your house and help you set up your passwords. And I remember them for you, so you call me, and, and you go, Oh, good day, sir. Yes, that password is 777. Very good. Would you like another password today, sir? LLL. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so next week, though, we're going to do some demos of cracking. I'm going to show you how easy cool. it is for people to break passwords. We're going to show you some tools that people use to do these. Uh, and some, we're going to also look at some vaulting uh, stuff as well. So we'll have several demos next time. Uh, in the not-too-distant future, Russ and I are going to be in sunny Prague, where we're going to do a show live from there, yeah. and, uh, if we can. And uh, we'll see you then. So be back next week, and thanks for tuning in. Take care.